You're listening to The Diarist, a Red Couch Black Dog production. Episode 15, Part 1, The Honeymoon. Often in my dream, Richard would be standing in the doorway, and I was trying uselessly to lift Margaret out. But in the dream... Unlike in reality, she was still living. She was gasping for air, and bubbles tinted with blood spilled over the tub. In these dreams, I could see the tap was still running, and my fear was that soon the whole room would fill and I would drown too. My sweet darling girl. That was Richard's new term of endearment. He said it often. When I brought him a scotch after work, before we made love. It felt like approval. And it seemed it had been a long time since he disapproved of anything I did. In those months before the wedding, I felt I could do no wrong. You would have thought Margaret had never existed. And for a few months, despite the trauma of it all, all my dreams had come true. Richard and I were married, just as he promised. Uh, It was hurried and nothing at all like I'd always dreamed. There was no Sarah McGinnis, no mother, and if you know me by now, you know I'd never wanted that sort of thing. Two months, almost to the day after Margaret's suicide, Richard and I were married at the courthouse downtown. No fanfare, no bridesmaids, just me in a conservative off-white suit, a box hat. I was sophisticated, but not a blushing bride. It bothered me somewhat when I compared this ceremony with what would have been had I married Stephen Morris. The days before the marriage, I thought often of the afternoon trying on wedding gowns, the very day after Richard took me. Yes, took me. I wanted to be taken, but nonetheless, when he pushed me against the office door, held my wrists, he was taking what he had wanted for months. His punishment was over. He added passion to his love, and after he took me, there could no longer be any dream of becoming Mrs. Stephen Morris. I was his, plain and simple. While the wedding caused me deep disappointment, the honeymoon brought a closeness between Richard and me that I could never have expected or imagined. Oh, dear reader, how I loathe to tell you the rest of the story. How much I wish things had stayed as they were on the honeymoon. Please indulge me in these few pages and allow me to recollect the honeymoon and the early days of our marriage. They were more perfect than any Audrey Hepburn or Doris Day movie. Indeed, it was an enchanted fairy tale. What can I say about the honeymoon? I was bathed in the warmth of Richard's affection for me. It seemed to me that in marrying him, I had calmed his fears of rejection. I felt less vigilant about hurting him. We spent hours together on the beach, him covering my skin with suntan lotion, together falling asleep on the hot beach, and we swam together and splashed in the enormous waves. Madame, sir, another round of Mai Tais? We're newlyweds. And what a (laughs) handsome couple you are. You've told me every time I've brought drinks out. I want a coconut. I want a drink from a coconut. Can you manage a coconut from Mrs. Hayes? Mrs. Hayes. Oh, I love him. Isn't he handsome? Yes, you both are. One coconut and sir? Just another Mai Tai. Would you make it a pina colada? Put it in the coconut with a big straw and decorate it for me. This is my honeymoon. Have I told you? I'm now Mrs. Richard Hayes. (laughs) Shall I make a reservation for dinner at the restaurant? The luau and bonfire are starting. We have a seat near the entertainment, right on the beach. That would be very nice. Oh no, darling. 
I want to have a picnic on the beach. I want to drink, drink, drink. Drink until I'm completely drunk. I'm afraid you are already completely drunk. <laughs> I am not. <laughs> Waiter, do Yes, you bring us a basket of food and a blanket. We'll take it out to the lagoon. And the pina colada. And the pina colada. And, and the Mai Tai. Very well. Are you terribly miserable being Mrs. Richard Hayes? <laughs> yes, I am horribly, terribly miserable. I suspected Why you... Why did you ever become an artist? Or continue with painting? I've always been afraid to ask. Why would you be? You can ask me anything. All right. Why didn't you follow your dream then? Well, how can you be so sure it was my dream? My real dream and not a because child... Because you painted those paintings in your office. You keep them there. They are with you. You are terribly romantic, Andrea Hayes. Well, tell me about your family then. Now that I'm Mrs. Hayes. Now that I'm in the family. We never did go visit your mother. Not with Margaret's accident. Richard, tell me. Please tell me the truth. Ask me the question. Ask me what's on your mind. I'm not- Is she dead? You already know the answer to that, don't you? I don't know for sure. Yes, she died. Why, though? Why would she kill herself? You know why. I don't know. I suppose it's what people feel under these kinds of tragic circumstances. When someone takes their own life or dies before their time. Yes, I understand. I'm sorry. So sorry you insisted on coming to the apartment that day. I wish more than anything you would have waited like I asked you. That's not... I don't remember most of that day at all. It doesn't matter. I'm glad I found her and not Margot. Please tell me about her. How did you two meet? Well, her sister introduced us. Her sister? Darling, I promise I want to tell you everything about my life, but this is our honeymoon. I'm afraid we'll upset ourselves if we continue with this line of conversation. Richard. What, darling? You're my best friend. I've never loved anyone the way I love you. I'll always be in love with you. Can I ask you something off the topic of Margaret? Anything. Do you believe that you've created this new me? That I am the woman I am because of you? I think you've always been your own girl. I love you. I honestly do. I've loved you since the moment we met. Darling. What is it? I wish I'd never gotten tangled up with that situation with Margaret. But, Margot, you wouldn't have had her. She's the silver lining. She's the reason. Yes, you're right. I love my daughter, our daughter. Darling, I must tell you something. And this is the reason it's so hard to talk about Margaret. Why it's so hard for me to believe that there wasn't... There wasn't some... Well, that I could have prevented her suicide. I thought you didn't want to... Yes, but if I don't get it off my chest, then I'll... May I tell you something? Of course. Margaret's suicide was so very hard on me. It would have been devastating for anyone, but, but finding her, well... It brought me back to the night my dad died. It brought back those feelings... If that makes any sense. Finding her? What do you mean? When I saw her. I, afterwards, of course. Oh, I guess I hadn't realized you saw her after. Did your father take his own life too? I haven't told anyone the whole story. In fact, I don't know that I ever talked about it after his funeral. So that's it? He killed himself too? Yes. I was an only child. 
not much older than Margo. Oh, I'm sorry. And it's no wonder you were so devoted to Margaret. I'm sure in your own way you wanted to prevent the inevitable. I think you may be right. What happened after that? My mom drew me closer to her. She spent more time with me, comforted me at night. Then later, a few years later, she married my stepfather. Are you close with him? Your stepfather? What is it? Why are you smiling? I'm not close to anyone but you. I've never been close to anyone until I met you. Believe me, it's the truth. Not even your mother? Not even my mother. I wish I could have met your mother. I wish we could have made that trip over Thanksgiving. You will. Did she like Margaret? Oddly, she did. That was the only time Margaret acted like a normal girl. Why do you suppose? I don't know. Maybe because my mom liked her. Not many people did. At least not the people in my circles. Oh. Was there a time when you two were social? Like any married couple? No. I mean the people close to me, my staff. They didn't like her so much. You were kind to her. I'm grateful for that. One night, very close to the end of our trip, we made the spontaneous decision to sleep out on the beach. I don't know why we did. We'd been drinking champagne in our room, and the sunset was a beautiful burnt orange. The ocean was rust-colored, and the sun was a pretty soft yellow as it sunk down into the horizon. It was warm out, maybe 80 degrees. The ocean was calm, and a very subtle wind swished through the palms. You see, I wanted to do anything with him. It was a thirst that had become essential to my existence. I say a thirst because it wasn't full satisfaction. I held a slight mistrust that this was too good to be true, or I wanted it so badly I was afraid I was deceiving myself. I never realized that I hadn't really known love in my life, and I shuddered to think if I'd followed the expected path and grew to believe material comfort, even physical attraction, was love. Father had loved me, I knew that, but we grow out of our parents' love, don't we? Needing a parent is a necessity. It's an absolute condition for survival. My love for Richard was vulnerability. It was being understood. On that trip, he was gentle, kind, and loving. In fact, his aggressive sexual acts were, at first, absent. At first, I thought he'd lost interest in me, because as I dressed... I expected to be pushed against a wall, restrained. I expected him to take me whenever and however he wanted, an arrangement that was thrilling to me. His rough treatment made me feel as though he was unable to control his impulsive desire for me. It lit a hidden fuse inside of me, the desire to be denied volition, to succumb to his will. But in Hawaii, it wasn't that way at all. He'd take my hand, keep his eyes fixed on me. He was gentle, and he'd take me in his arms and kiss my cheek. I'm so in love with you, Andrea. Then we'd make love, and he'd take his time. He'd ask me, are you all right? I would keep my eyes on him, and I could see he was desperate for me too, that I held responsibility for his love and happiness. It was clear he'd loved me for a long time, perhaps from the beginning. He certainly loved me that night I took Margot back to my parents' home, the night I rebuffed his affection. I realized, looking at him in the setting sun, I realized as I touched his tan cheek and moved his hair to the side of his face, he had been so hurt by my rejection of his love. I 
wish we could have pineapple every day for the rest of our lives. Oh, you like it, do you? I like you. Everything's perfect. How lucky we were to find this cove. I brought cards. Do you want to play? Cards? Are we that old, really? <laughs> no. Rummy? Have we never played cards together, Mrs. Hayes? No, Mr. Hayes, we have not. I'm afraid we wasted all of our leisure time on deranged acts of passion. Deranged acts of passion? A lot of girls wouldn't consider that wasted time. Really? What kind of girls? I love you. <laughs> I love you too. If not cards, what should we do? Shall I take my bathing suit off? Yes, darling. I would like that. That's a very good idea. Do it slowly, so I can savor every moment. A little show? Yes, darling, a little show. All right. There, now you have your choice. We can play rummy, or we can go skinny dipping. One or the other, huh? I'd quite like to play a game of rummy with my beautiful, naked wife. Why don't you deal the cards, darling? Why are you so cruel to me? Don't you know I was teasing you? I'll go skinny dipping by myself. You'll see us from all the way to China. You'll never see me again. Wait, I'm coming after you. See that rock in the distance? Kiss me. No, silly girl. Do you think you can win me in a race? Against you? That's right. Oh, darling, look over there. What is it? On the shore. Is someone taking our clothes? Where? You cheater. That isn't fair at all. I swam as fast as I could toward the rocky edge of the cove. Of course, he passed me in no time. I felt the rush of his body as he quickly overtook me. He was competitive. I knew that about him. When it came to winning, he lost all sense of things in the way of his conquest. It took me a little longer than I'd anticipated, and instead of the large rock by the shore of the cove, I used his dark silhouette as my beacon. Wasn't that the metaphor to describe all of it? He was my guide. He would lead me into the future. A dark figure. Just a silhouette keeping watch over me as I navigated the unpredictable seas. My legs were weak when I finally made it back to the beach. I kept my eyes on him as I approached. The moonlight made his tanned skin glisten. I noticed the contour of his muscles. Neither of us said anything. We just embraced and he kissed me. We stood there on the wet shore, by the water's edge. The sand was smooth against my feet as the surf moved in and retreated. Let's walk back to the blanket. All right. Are you all right? Of course. I'm happy. Are you? Darling, don't you know? For the first time in my life, I'm not playing a game. Neither am I. I've never loved a woman before you. You're the only one. You will always be the only one. I wish I could erase everything else, all my mistakes. I wish I'd waited for you. I just had no idea you would I love you. I love you. May I ask you? What is it? Do you want me as much as you did before we were married? More. It's different now, when we make love. It's more... I love kissing you. I love touching you. Don't do that. I don't like women challenging me. Why? I don't want to hurt you, Andrea. 
Is that it? If a woman upsets you, you want to hurt her? Stop pushing. What now? What will you do now? Have I upset you? I don't want you. I've never wanted you. Richard, I can't breathe. I can't. Andrea, why are you making me do this to you? I want you to. I want to see how much I can take. How much I can make you do. Why? To see how far you can go. How far will you go, Richard? Why? Don't do this. Don't push me. Never say you don't want me. Do you understand? Here. Kiss me, darling. Don't be afraid of how far you will take it. I trust you. I want to be right there. At the edge. With you. God, Andrea. You're terrifying me. The surf pulled in and retreated. We'd become accustomed to the tide. And in the beautiful moonlight, Richard's brown skin contrasted mine, pale even after a week in the sun. After we made love, he started an altogether new ritual. He'd found the bruises he'd left, the red marks, and he touched each one, kissed me. He expressed sympathy. My poor, sweet, darling girl. Have I hurt you? These were our secrets. And of course I wondered if it was this way with all husbands and wives. And what difference would it make anyway? It was how it was between us. Hey everyone, Donna here. I want to share with you a trailer for a podcast that I have been listening to and binging on for the last couple weeks. It's called Targeted True Crime Domestic Violence, and it is a powerful nonfiction podcast that delves into the issue of domestic violence and follows one case a season. So I'm going to play the promo for you, and uh, I hope that you get a chance to listen because it is a great podcast. At the Targeted Podcast, we tell stories of women, men, and children who were targeted by domestic abuse. Some survive. He saw I was no longer playing with them. That's when all hell broke loose. Some die. He carved out a life for himself. It was a life that came to an untimely end. None will ever be the same. She repeatedly asked for help for domestic abuse and found very little. We investigate cases of family violence using academic research to help us interpret the events. I'm a college professor, and I think we need to stop making family violence a secret. It's time to tell our stories, use our experiences to help, to heal, and provoke change. You can find Targeted True Crime Domestic Violence on iTunes, Google Play, and all the major podcast platforms. I'm Mo Blackwell, the host of Targeted. Peace, my friends. Peace.